All right, hello and welcome. Everyone's back for Advanced Basket Weaving 201. Fantastic. Um, just kidding, I'm very bad at that. Not that I've tried, so I assume I'd be bad. Anywho, um, this is Farm One. Welcome. You guys all made it through Intro to Farm. Now you're here for the real deal, right? You have the, the fundamentals down. Hopefully you haven't suppressed all those memories from the summer, right? I hope so. I, I really. There's videos online, though. You can go back and review the whole thing if you want to. Relive it moment for moment. Um, but this is where we kind of hit the ground running in terms of the material you need to know when you get on rotations and you're actually treating uh, patients, right? Um, you're going to find this is a little bit of a different ball of wax in terms of the content we're covering. This is less conceptual and more like actual details, actual nitty-gritty, like getting into how we use these drugs, how do we select drugs, you know, uh, what kind of patients are good candidates or not good candidates, et cetera. Um, and so it's a little different in terms of how you study for it, et cetera. Um, in terms of things that I'm looking for, in terms of like when we cover the drugs, like know things like the mechanisms of action. You need to know things like the adverse reactions, things like contraindications and whatnot. Dosing is not going to be as important here, right? So I'm not going to hammer you on, on doses necessarily. You have other classes for that, and you have your rotations to figure that stuff out. Um, but know some of the concepts behind how we dose things, right? If I say you dose an antibiotic every six hours, like there's a reason for that, and we can get into why that is, right? So those are things I kind of want you to know. Because um, you can always look up a dose, but if you don't even know what drug to look up in the first place, then... You just don't even know, right? So you got you to be able to start with somewhere. Um, in terms of how this test or this uh, course will be laid out, uh, you can see the stuff we're covering this year. You guys can see all the material I posted up, right? The first two PowerPoints in the syllabus. Good. Um, so we're going to have three assignments are going to be due. These are all going to be prescription assignments based off of the drugs that we're covering or the sections that we're covering. Uh, so those will be representative of that. Uh, we'll have two quizzes that will be done in class, pretty similar to last semester. They'll be, you know, different question formats, usually like uh, matching or fill in the blank or you know, different things like that. So it'll be pretty similar to that. And then we're going to have three written exams. Um, again, 50 questions, five multiple choices, um, pretty, pretty straightforward on, on that aspect, right? Um, any questions so far on, in terms of that? The due dates are all here. I'll get the prescription assignment posted up today. Um, the first quiz is going to be on 920 and it's going to be covering the antibiotic stuff. That's a good one to start off with since it's going to be kind of a big bolus of drugs you're going to be learning all at once. And so we can quiz you on that make sure you're kind of getting the details you need to know for, for, for those purposes. Everyone's extremely quiet and silent. So I'm assuming everyone's verbalizing their agreement to continue on this journey with me. So, um, so any questions so far? What have you heard about? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, so that's, that's different as well. So for this class, the final exam is only going to be covering um, the, the units that we're covering for that section there. What you find is, is that um, while in Intro to Farm, it was, you know, a lot of concepts that kind of built on one another. So in terms of that, it kind of needed to be cumulative. Here, you're going to find that each section is kind of its own little walled off section, right? Um, you're going to find that, you know, stuff you learn in cardio is not necessarily applicable 100% to stuff you're going to be learning, you know, say in, in Hemonc, right? You know, there'll be some crossover there. And so as we cover drugs that can fulfill roles in multiple different sections of different organ systems, you're going to find that um, that stuff will come back up, right? So again, if I'm talking about antibiotics now, today, that's a very pervasive sort of topic there. We'll talk about antibiotics in terms of derm. We'll talk about in terms of, um, you know, uh, ortho in terms of, I mean, all kinds of, it shows up everywhere. So you need to know those things. So if I talk about penicillins later on in the class, you still need to know things about penicillin. So in that way, we'll cover those details as they become salient. Okay. Um, how are you guys going to study for this class? Anyone have any ideas? Pray? Praying helps, right? So start off with a good foundation of praying. And then on top of that, what are you going to do, right? Because again, you know, when you see those Two sets of footsteps in the beach, like it's not always just the one. Like you got to carry yourself part of the way too, right? So how are you going to do that? Okay, so um, again, you can't just like do like rote memorization of all these facts. You're going to drive yourself crazy, right? So um, the things I want you to focus on, if I spend like a lot of time on a topic in class, like chances are I'm probably going to be asking about it, right? So you don't need to know every single detail about every single individual drug. What I want you to do is try to group this stuff into buckets, right? So try to group things into categories. Try to put them into these buckets. You can separate them out, and that way you can kind of go back to that bucket when a question comes up 
on the test. So for example, when I ask a test question, I'll say like, okay, you have this kind of patient, they're coming in for this. Um, usually I'm gonna go ahead and just give you the diagnosis because that's not really the forte of my class or my profession. You have the diagnosis at which drug is most appropriate for this patient. And you'll just have four drug choices and there'll be the generics and the brand names. I always put generic and brand. However, what do they put on pants, anyone know? Generic only on pants, right? I do add brand names in there because I want you to have some familiarity with those because you're going to find a lot of drugs only get called by their brand names out in the in the real world. So, for instance, anyone heard of Rocephin before? That's a brand name, right? A lot of people don't just say, give me one gram of Ceftriaxone. They just say Rocephin because it's easier. So I wanted to kind of get you exposed to that. Um, but you'll have four drug choices, and your job is to link back those drugs and say, okay, well, I know – you know, ceftriaxone, I know it's a third generation cephalosporin. Okay, what do I know about third generation cephalosporins? Okay, I know this is their coverage in terms of antibiotics, or bugs they cover. I know this is their mechanism. I know this is their side effects. By linking it back to buckets, it's going to be easier to categorize this information. Okay, and so in terms of studying, a lot of people try different things with varying degrees of success. Flashcards work for some people, right? You can buy pre made flashcards, however, they may have varying levels of detail may go over in detail and things that we don't really cover here in class too much. Probably don't need to know those as much. May not go into as much detail on some things that I cover more. So add stuff to those cards, right? Um, you guys familiar with Sketchy Farm? I've heard you were talking about that. Um, I hate Sketchy Farm because I'm not a very visual learner. However, for some people it works great. So if that works for you, go for it, right? Um, some people like what they call mind mapping. Have you guys ever heard of that? Yeah, so basically it's like starting out saying like, okay, I'm thinking about antibiotics. So antibiotics is like a big bubble, right? And then you have branches that come off of that bubble into various categories. So I can say, okay, antibiotics, okay, penicillins. What do I know about penicillins? Okay, I know they have a mechanism of action. They work on the cell wall. I know they have these side effects. I know these are the drugs that fit into that category. It's a way to visually sort of represent the connections you're making in your mind to be able to better visualize that on the test. So for some people, they like that. You can look up some articles online and find more information about that. But um, again, find a way that works for you. If you find that you take a quiz and you totally bomb it, don't just try the same thing over and over again because you're going to find the same results probably happen. So you got to take a step back, kind of figure out what you did wrong, and then kind of come up with a new new tactic. Uh, and again, what's your best resource for this class? Me, right? Reach out early. So it doesn't really help you a whole lot if you reach out after the test that you bombed. You need to reach out beforehand to make sure you have those points that are that are you know clear in your mind. You may be sitting there two hours on something you're like, this just doesn't make sense when an email to me could have saved you all that time. Five, five minutes with me oftentimes will save you a lot of time later on, okay? So remember to reach out early. I'm generally pretty good about emails for the most part, so uh, you can pass for me all you want, okay? That's why I'm here, it's because you guys pay for me to be here, right? Use your resources. Anyways, that's a lot of that preamble to get into actually talking about some drugs. So I wanna start off first by covering a microbiology review. Have you taken any micro stuff in your curriculum here yet? No, okay. Will you be at some point? Okay. It'll be incorporated in, in certain parts. So some, be, you know, some people will have like a whole micro class. Um, it just depends on your curriculum. That was a prereq for you though, right? So you've had some passing familiarity with microbiology. I'm not going to get super in the weeds on this stuff. I'm going to talk about what we need to know in terms of um, the bugs and how we're going to be selecting antibiotics to treat those, those bugs, right? So Colloquially, this is usually called the bugs and drugs section because you're going to learn about the bugs and then what drugs you use to treat them. Okay. So anyway, so just at the very bare minimum, one big delineation between groups of, uh, of bacteria are going to be their gram stain, right? What is a gram stain? Yeah, you, you add a stain to a bacteria that you've been culturing out, right? or not necessarily cultured out, but you say you take a sample of someone's urine or their bronchial aspirate, or whatever the case may be, you <laughs> apply this stain, and you see whether the bacteria take it up or not, right? If you have a gram-positive bug, you're going to find that will take up that stain, right? And so it ends up looking this nice dark purple color versus it looking more kind of pinkish for the gram-negative because their cell walls are different, right? Why do you think this would matter in terms of antibiotics? hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to find that certain drugs work better for gram positive. Some of them work better for gram negatives. And a lot of it goes back to, you know, the components of the, that, that bacteria, right? Is it the cell wall that does it? Is it something about the proteins they're producing? There could be a lot of different things here, but that's kind of the first thing you're looking for. And, and again, you as a clinician, do you think you're going to actually look at these pictures to see whether it's gram positive or negative? 
never, you're generally not going to be doing that. But you'll get a report back from the lab that says, hey, we have gram-negative rods showing up in this culture, right? Or we have gram-positive cocci in clusters or things like that. You need to be able to make that interpretation. So when you see gram-positive, you should be thinking, okay, I'm thinking this group of bugs. If it's gram-negative, you're thinking this, right? That's kind of like the ba very baseline the difference between those two. I kind of want to get you familiar with some of the bacteria you're going to be running into very commonly when dealing with patients here. And again, some of this is going to be dependent on the site of infection. And I'll have a couple of tables kind of looking at that. And you'll get a feel for this over time. So when a patient shows up with uh, a big abscess on their butt, you're going to be thinking, okay, well, I think it could be this, this, or this, right? You're coming up with your differential. If they show up with uh, a pneumonia, you're thinking, okay, it could be these group of bugs. You want to keep that differential open. You'll learn more about that in your medicine courses, as you'll see there. So anyway, so starting off with some gram-positive cocci. Again, does anyone have any gram-positive cocci on them right now? Yes, you're all colonized. You're all covered with bacteria right now, right? Um, so a lot of times you're going to find a lot of gram-positive bugs tend to live on the skin, which is why when you see a lot of skin infections, guess what the likely organisms are? Usually gram positives, right? So you're going to have things like your staph epis. You're going to have things like your staph aureus. Why do we care about staph aureus? It cause a lot of pretty serious infections there, right? So for instance, staph aureus can be delineated into MSSA or MRSA. Everyone's heard of MRSA before, correct? What does MRSA mean? Methicillin resistant staph aureus. What is methicillin? It's an antibiotic, right? So again, it was a, a penicillin type of antibiotic that we would use. And if it, if the bacteria was susceptible to that antibiotic, then you could say, okay, it was MSSA, it's methicillin sensitive or methicillin susceptible staph aureus versus MRSA it means it's resistant, right? Which one do you think is more um, worrisome clinically? Why, why the resistant one? 100%, right? It's harder to treat, right? We had to go with bigger guns in terms of antibiotics. I like to talk about antibiotics in terms of like weaponry for whatever reason. That's how I kind of associate it in my mind. So thinking about like regular old penicillins, like kind of like a, a slingshot, and then you have things that are more like a nuclear bomb in some cases, right? And we'll kind of go, go over those delineations there. Um, probably speaks more about me in my mind, how that works than, than anything else. But you know, the association, the analogy will make sense in a little bit. But you got to use bigger guns when you're going up to these more resistant bugs. And resistance is going to be a huge issue as you're going to run into. Because sometimes these patients that are medically complex are coming from the nursing home. They're going to have bacteria that you have almost no drug options available to you due to the fact they've become resistant to nearly everything else, right? And we'll kind of cover those. Um, as I mentioned, Staph epi is a common skin contaminant. Very frequently, if you get like blood cultures, it'll come back saying you got Staph epi in there. Very frequently, that can be like a uh, contaminant where it's not actually truly causing the infection. It just happens to um, come up. And why do you think that contaminates a lot of blood cultures? Well, how do you get that blood? You have to go through the skin, right? So again, that's where things like proper like decontamination and disinfection is really important for those sorts of things there. Um, and again, you'll get a feel for this as you kind of cover this more and more. And on rotations, you'll start to see these sorts of things there. Um, strep pneumo is really important in terms of what type of infections do you think? It says pneumo, so probably the lungs, upper respiratory tract. We're going to find a lot of strep pneumo is going to be responsible for otitis medias and, and sinusitis and, and uh, pneumonias and things like that. And um, how about enterococci? Where do you think you find those? Probably in the GI tract. Absolutely right. So some of these things are kind of intuitive based off of the name, right? So if you know the suffixes and prefixes, you can kind of get a feel for where you're probably going to be finding these bugs here. doesn't mean they always stay there, right? So for instance, why do you think I might find a urine sample that would have enterococcus in it? Well, how, how do you think they got from the GI tract up to the, to the urine? Just the location, right? Think about the anatomy, right? And especially for females, you find that much more likely because, again, what is very close to the urethra? The rectum is pretty close there, right? So you can see that translocation of those bugs in some cases there. That's why you can see those kind of those gut organisms potentially in the urine sample, right? So sometimes you can have cross-contamination, but think about the anatomy. Think about the physiology that kind of goes into some of this stuff. So um, now we talked about the aerobes, right? And now we have our anaerobes. What's the difference between those two? That one requires oxygen. One requires no oxygen, right? Um, anaerobes, which one do you think is harder to culture out, anaerobes or aerobes? Anaerobes are actually a lot more difficult. You have to actually specifically order an anaerobic culture because what happens if these bugs get exposed to air? They die, right? So again, that can be really tough. Sometimes you'll get a culture and there could be anaerobes there you don't even know about in some cases. But by knowing the type of infection you're dealing with, you are, know that certain things are more likely or less likely as it turns out. So as an example, things like peptostreptococcus and peptococcus, a lot of those like to grow in the mouth, right? So what kind of like presentation would I want to think about 
these kind of bugs. Like saying showing up to the ER. So there was like a bar fight. Someone got bit by a person. You just start thinking about anaerobes that grow in the mouth, right? You think that's silly, but you know, if you go to the ER, guess what? You're gonna find this stuff, right? Especially you go to Daytona during bike week. <laughs> Crazy stuff happens out there. So I hear. Never, not brave enough to ride a bike, so I would never find out. But if you work out there, you probably see some of this stuff. Um, or animal bites, for instance, right? You find a lot of bacteria that grow in the mouth tend to be anaerobic for, for whatever reason. Um, we also have things like the bacilli that tend to grow more so in, um, in wounds in some cases, and we can find this also in the GI tract. So uh, in particular, Clostridium difficile. Why do we care about this one? It's C. diff, right? What's the big deal with C. diff? It's a pretty nasty sort of enteric bug. It's an opportunistic bug. Right? What do you want to mean by that? Yeah, exactly. So you may be exposed to Clostridium difficile on, on a somewhat a routine basis, but it normally doesn't have the ability to, to colonize and kind of stake its claim. Um, however, if you disrupt certain bacteria that normally live in a, a person, that's where it can kind of take hold, right? So we talk about opportunistic pathogens. We'll talk about that a lot when we get to the HIV section. Um, but C. diff is a huge one. It's very clinically relevant because when do we disrupt, say, the normal gut flora where C. diff can then take hold? We give it antibiotics, right? So this is a problem with frequent antibiotic overprescribing, -prescri over especially for, for viral illnesses. You'll disrupt the normal gut flora because do antibiotics know the difference between pathogenic bacteria versus what normal flora is there? Can't tell the difference, right? It's going to kill indiscriminately. So you're going to find certain antibiotics going to be more likely to cause um, disruption of the gut flora. That's why sometimes you'll see people giving probiotics along with antibiotics. And you think, why am I giving probiotics and antibiotics? That seems kind of counterintuitive. A lot of it is due to that disruption of that normal gut flora, right? And so by doing that, uh, that getting hold, you can see C. diff colitis, which can be very significant. Um, uh, you know, you normally have very profuse watery diarrhea associated with this. Um, people are getting dehydrated. They're not getting good nutrition. I mean, there's lots of problems that can develop from this, right? And it's because we're usually giving too many antibiotics. Other things. Um, now we have the gram negative that you're going to be running into. And these are your gram negative aerobes, so they do require oxygen here. Um, the Enterobacteriaceae tend to be a very wide ranging sort of group here. Um, anyone know where you might find these bugs showing up? So a lot of these can show up in things like the urine, right? So E. coli tends to show up, you know, in the urine. You have things like, you know, proteus and serratia. Um, typically, when you're thinking about the gut, you want to think about anaerobes, and you also want to think about gram-negative bugs, right? So, again, that's why you frequently see a lot of these can show up. Things like E. coli, you think of being kind of like a GI infection. You can see in the urine, too, because there is uh, sort of that, that closeness in, in terms of proximity there. Um, so those are ones you're going to run into pretty commonly. You tend to see resistance develop to these quite frequently, and so this is going to be a problem we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, in terms of anaerobes, Bacteroides fragilis is going to be one notable one we'll talk about in terms of, of coverage. And again, we'll say like certain antibiotics cover this bug, but not this bug. We'll talk about that later. And then you have certain things like Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Who's heard of that before? Okay, so why do we care about Pseudomonas? Be another really severe infection. So it's kind of on the on the level of something like an MRSA, right? So if you hear someone's got a pseudomonal infection, that's typically not a good thing, right? Usually the people have maybe a compromised immune system, or maybe they're constantly in, in contact with the healthcare uh, environment, right? So you think about like people coming from nursing homes and things like that that tend to pick up these really resistant gram negatives, things like pseudomonas, right? And so in some cases, you know, a patient comes in that really, really sick, say they have sepsis, oftentimes we have to start what we call empiric coverage with antibiotics. Anyone know what that means? Kind of going as broad a coverage as possible because you're saying like, I don't know what this patient is infected with. So how long does it take for cultures to come back? Anyone know? It could take a long time in some cases, right? Several days to a couple of weeks in some cases. And so in those in those cases there, you're going to find you need to start very broad and try to cover everything that could be likely to cause an infection in that patient, and then you scale it back. And we'll talk about de-escalation strategies a little bit later on. But if I have, say, that little lady coming from the nursing home who is septic, I'm covering for things like MRSA. I'm covering for things like pseudomonas because those are the worst players that the patient could be dealing with. And then as the cultures come back, as the patient gets better, I will then de-escalate, as we'll see. So that's a strategy we'll talk about a little bit later on. Okay. Um, other things like you know, stenotrophomonas, acinetobacter, these are also going to be pretty resistant bugs that show up in the more kind of sick sort of patients you're going to see like in places like the ICU 
a lot of times. Um, and then other cases, um, we're going to run into things like H flu, Mark's out cataralis. These are really notable in terms of uh, causing a lot of upper and lower respiratory tract infections. So those are ones you're going to want to think about when we get to the ENT section a little bit later on. And then things like gonorrhea, um, Neisseria species will also fall into this category as well. And then we also have atypical pathogens. So these are the ones that don't really fit into the category of being either gram negative or positive. And so you have things like chlamydia, legionella, mycoplasma. Um, a lot of times these can uh, develop as sort of like respiratory infections. Does anyone know where legionella comes from or where it got its name? Yeah, there's a Legionnaires Conference, and so they had a, an AC unit that was uh, colonized with this bacteria they'd never really seen before and started causing a bunch of pneumonias. And so when they finally found the bug that was responsible, it, they, they named it Legionella. Um, and so if you ever get like a board style question, it says, oh, there's like an AC unit that was bad or something like that, like always think Legionella, always think Legionnaires disease, right? Um, but yeah, so again, these are a lot of uh, respiratory bugs you're going to run into. When you hear like an atypical pneumonia, that's that what they're referring to as the, being caused by sort of atypical bacteria there. So this is uh, kind of a better way to sort of organize the, the information I kind of presented there um, because again when you're seeing a patient you're taking their complaint, you're getting their history and you're coming up with a differential on kind of on what's most likely to be causing the issues that your patient's presenting with, right? And so again, you're going to know kind of off the bat, do I think it's a skin, skin and soft tissue infection? Do I think it's a meningitis? So I think the bone and joint. And so based off of what you think it is, you're going to come up with a differential of the most likely bugs that are have likely cause an infection there. And so based off of that, that will guide your antibiotic decisions. Okay. So for instance, when you see skin and soft tissue infection, you notice there's a lot of uh, gram positive bugs that you have to worry about, right? So again, frequently we'll find antibiotics are being used that will kind of cater more towards covering the gram positives, right? Um, versus something like, you know, meningitis, it's a much wider range here. There's gram negatives, gram positives. We may have to go with a broader spectrum of coverage and maybe use a couple different antibiotics in order to treat that. Sometimes these things are age-based where you can find that if an infant comes in, um, they're going to have a different group of antibiotics or a bacteria you're worried about causing meningitis than if there was a very old patient or say an adult patient. So again, sometimes age can play a role here. You know, thinking about the bone and joint, you see a lot of gram positives, but, you know, when do you think a gram negative coming from, say, like the GI tract could be causing a bone and joint infection? Think about those patients that are chronically laid up, right? What happens when you are laid up in a bed for a long period of time? Because the cubitus pressure ulcers, right? What happens if that goes all the way down to the bone? Guess what? What resides around the butt? A lot of gram negative bugs, right? So that's where you can start to see that some of those can then uh, infect the, the bone there and actually can cause a gram negative, you know, osteomyelitis potentially, right? So you got to think about the clinical situation and what could be causing uh, this in your patient, right? Uh, other cases here, like the abdomen. With the abdomen, you always want to think about gram negatives and you also want to think about anaerobes, right? This is where I see our bacteroides, you see a lot of enterococcus from the gram positive side of things, and they're going to see a lot of gram negative bugs here. So when I have a patient who's coming in, and they're say, I think it's appendicitis, and they're gonna be going to surgery, I have to make sure that I'm covering for things that could get spilled out of the GI tract and into the abdominal cavity, right? So again, you're gonna find your antibiotic coverage can change. And so even if you think you're going into surgery and you're like, I'm going into surgery, I don't have to worry a lot about medicine, you still have to think about things like the antibiotics that you're gonna be using as prophylaxis to prevent an infection from occurring in the first place, right? Um, urinary tract, again, you're gonna see a lot of uh, gram negatives though, but think about, does a patient have you know, a catheter that's in place for long periods of time. Anytime you introduce foreign material into the patient, whether it's an endotracheal tube, whether it's going to be a urinary catheter, bacteria like to grow on that and then can kind of move their way into the body, right? So you can see things like gram-positive urinary tract infections because of an indwelling catheter potential, right? So these are things you, you run into. Um, again, upper and lower respiratory tract, you see kind of the, the typical three is strep pneumo, H flu, and Mark's alley cataralis. You're going to run into these quite frequently, as we're going to see here. And again, the purpose is not to memorize this entire chart here, but this will become more clear as we get into these individual sections. And it will kind of bring it back into like, why do we choose this antibiotic for this infection versus you know, someone presenting with something different? We choose a different set of antibiotics. Okay? This will make more sense as we get into those sections there. Um, right, now, when I say nosocomial, what does that mean? Something we gave to the patient, right? So, and I always tell people that like a hospital is the worst place to get better because again, it's colonized with all kinds of nasty bacteria, especially if you hang out in the ICU for too long. Um, frequently, the first thing me and my wife will do whenever we get back from a shift at the hospital is like just change our clothes, right? Because chances are you probably picked up something on your shoes or your clothes and we don't want to go and hug our kids 
you know, you know, a bunch of MRSA smeared all over him, pseudomonas and all that, right? You just don't want to do that to him. But um, you notice here that when you have a nosocomial infection versus, say, a community infection, which one do you think has more kind of virulent, really pathogenic bacteria? Probably the nosocomial ones, right? Because, again, this is a, an environment where you're kind of putting on a lot of selective pressure. You're going to see a lot more nasty bugs like your MRSAs and your pseudomonas and whatnot. But, again, trends over time, you're going to see that that may change, right? We're starting to see more community-based MRSA because we're over-prescribing antibiotics. And that MSSA that may have been there before, guess what? It gets converted over into MRSA when it then becomes resistant. So... How do we choose like what kind of antibiotics we're going to use for a patient here? And so uh, has anyone ever heard of an antibiogram before? Wherever you go to work, I suggest getting familiarized with your antibiogram uh, there because this will actually guide a lot of your practice in, in determining what antibiotics you're going to use for what type of infection. So basically what an antibiogram is, is you'll take uh, all the cultures from every patient you that comes into your, your healthcare facility, whether you work in the ER, uh, inpatient side, wherever, and they're collecting all those cultures there. And then they culture them out and they will test for sensitivity. So we'll talk about that in just a moment here to see how sensitive or resistant they are to different antibiotics. So here you can see the actual bacteria. And then on this side, you're going to see the different antibiotics. And we'll cover all of these um, to some degree here in just a little bit. You can see the number of isolates they actually had here. And then these numbers here are the percentage of those isolates that were sensitive to that antibiotic. Okay. So looking at something like E. coli, you can see here varying ranges of sensitivities here. So when you were treating a patient, do you think you'd want to pick up an antibiotic that had, say, a 65% chance of that bacteria being sensitive? Or do you want something maybe has like 96% chance? 96. Probably 96, right? You don't want to tell your patient, hey, there's a 65% chance that I'm right when I'm giving this antibiotic. It's going to treat that bacteria. You want to do that, right? You want to be a little bit more sure than that. So, again, these are things that will kind of guide and, and dictate what type of antibiotics you're going to be dealing with. Now, if I were to say working in downtown Orlando, do you think the type of bacteria you're exposed to would be different, say, than if I went to, um, say, middle of nowhere, Arkansas? Yeah, right, because different bacteria live in different environments. You're going to find they may have different resistance patterns. And so just because you pull this one, this one is from Massachusetts, it would be very different than it would be if you, say, came down here to Orlando, right? So these are things you have to know depending on where you're working at. If you move, you may find that you have different prescribing patterns based off the different um, resistance patterns you're going to see in the bacteria here. So again, get very familiar with this wherever you go to work. Just ask to see one. The, the lab can usually produce one for you if no one else can find it. Um, and it's very kind of interesting reading. You have a few extra moments on, on your rotations there, right? Anywho, how do we determine if a, if a bacteria is going to be susceptible to an antibiotic, right? So has anyone heard of like a disc diffusion test? What does that mean? Okay. Okay. That, that's exactly it. 100%, right? So we're going to culture out the bacteria, right? So we get an auger plate and we have it all cultured out here. And then we'll place these little discs that have different antibiotics in them. And so what you're looking for is that zone of inhibition, right? So again, how wide of a zone is there where the bacteria are not actively replicating? So for something like this, this drug probably worked pretty well for that bacteria, right? Because you're going to notice this nice clean circle around it where nothing can, can really grow at that point, right? And where do you think the concentration of drug is highest? Yeah, on the disc, and then as you get further and further away, it's diffusing, right? You get lower and lower concentrations, right? So you're seeing, like, how far of a circle can I make there where the before the bacteria can kind of overcome that, and they just keep growing, okay? There's going to be what we talk about as being the minimum inhibitory concentration. If you ever see that term, MIC, that means that concentration you need to hit of that uh, antibiotic to keep that bacteria from growing. Okay, from actively replicating. That'll be an important concept we'll cover in just a little bit. So, for instance, this one looks like it'd be probably pretty susceptible to that that uh, antibiotic. What do you think about this one? Not as maybe like what you consider intermediate, right? So intermediate is not usually something you're looking for. You want something to be really susceptible when you're choosing antibiotic for that patient. There. What do you think about this one here? Right, it's not effective at all, right? Be pretty much uh, resistant completely to that drug. So I would not use this drug to treat this bacteria, but maybe this one or this one, whatever it happens to be, would be a better option for that patient. Okay, that makes sense? Another way you could do that here is where you can actually get individual drugs, and you'll see that you have varying levels of concentrations of those antibiotics, and you can see where exactly you start to get that inhibition here, right? So you notice here at the very bottom, you're probably going to get the lowest concentrations where the bacteria can continue to grow, but as you get further and further up, as concentrations get higher, you're going to see better uh, bacterial kill and better inhibition there. So sometimes I can tell you specifically what the MIC is for that particular bacteria for that particular drug, okay? 
So again, just useful information. And again, you're not gonna be looking at these, but when you get those reports back from the lab, that's essentially what they're doing is they're trying to determine how susceptible are those bacteria to the antibiotics. So how do we control resistance of these bacteria? When you practice, you give you, you give you a nice little set of darts and they say, okay, you just basically throw in whatever it hits. That's, that's how you're gonna treat your patient, right? No, we're gonna be a little bit more guided than this. But why do we care about resistance, right? What is this a big problem? Limited antibiotics, right? So if you had to think, if you're a drug company, right? And remember we talked about how long is a patent on a, on a new, new drug when you... 20 years, right? And it takes you 15 years, say, to get through all the clinical testing and all that. You only got five years to make your money back. Would you rather um, market a drug that maybe can treat something like diabetes, which you know affects millions and millions of people in the U.S., or would you rather say, target something um, like a bacteria that maybe only affects, say, a couple, maybe you know, tens of thousands of people in a year? Probably the diabetes thing, right? So you tend to find there's a lot more marketing push towards medications to treat those things that are much more common because it tends to be much more lucrative as it turns out. So there's not a huge push for producing new antibiotics. And again, drug development is hard. It's expensive. We know that. And so because of that, we are rapidly running out of options in order to treat these patients here because they're more and more becoming resistant to the drugs we have. Every year you may get one or two new antibiotics, but again, it is a very slow process as compared to something to treat hypertension or diabetes or hyperlipidemia, all those other things that are quite much more uh, common in, in your patients there. But the problem is we're getting much more resistant bacteria here. So for instance, with the gram positives, certainly higher incidence of MRSA popping up here. You have things like VRE. Anyone know what that stands for? Yeah, that's right. Vancomycin resistant enterococci, right? So again, these are going to be gut bacteria um, that are resistant to vancomycin. And we'll figure out vancomycin is actually one of those bigger guns we're going to talk about. It's really good for things like MRSA. And then you have VRSA. You know what that stands for? Yeah, so it's like, if I, I made this bad analogy the other day, but anyone ever play Pokemon? Maybe they still do. Right. Um, it's like when you have like that little bubble sore and it turns into like an ivy sore and then it evolves into a no, 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 I'm talking about. You can look it up, right? Divinosaur, right? Um, this is like MRSA, right? MSSA starts like that, and then it involves into MRSA, then it involves into VRSA. It's bad news, right? Like you don't want to do that. So um, because of that, we're seeing much more resistant bacteria that we're running out of antibiotic options for. Usually it depends on, on the setting, right? So again, if you're working up in the ICU, you're much more likely to find it there because you're getting those patients that are coming from healthcare environments. You're having patients who are on um, long-term ventilation, right? You know, so they're uh, intubated for long periods of time. Like you're just more likely to see it in those kind of settings versus if you're like in say, you know, the urgent care sort of setting there. We've seen kind of people walking in off the street, so to speak, right? So again, it's rare, but as time goes on, when you're practicing, it may be more common as, as you'll see. In terms of gram-negative resistance, we see this very, very commonly. Um, we're going to see things like extended spectrum beta-lactamases. We'll talk about what a beta-lactamase is a little bit later on. But these are things where, and it's interesting because the gram-negative bugs, they tend to send these little plasmids off to one another, and they tend to share resistance patterns. So you can have something like a Klebsiella producing carbapenemase, and that's basically an enzyme that destroys a class of drugs that we have. And it can send that off, and you can have E. coli that's producing that, or Pseudomonas that starts producing that, right? So they share their little tricks to one another, and they become very resistant, right? So if you see like an ESBL or a KPC, those are things you're really worried about, because that means that it's basically neutralizing the medications there, right? Because again, as you put that selective pressure on the bacteria, you're going to be selecting out for the really strong ones that tend to have develop those resistance patterns there. And most of the resistant gram-negative infections we have, about 70%, are due to Klebsiella, E. coli, Pseudomonas, and Acinetobacter, right? So those are really common gram-negative rods that are going to be causing a lot of those big issues there. And again, what, follow, or what causes resistance to occur? A lot of times this is basically due to indiscriminate sort of antimicrobial use. So if you have a patient presents to you, say, in the urgent care, and they've got the sniffles, and they say, I want an antibiotic, I want a Z-Pak, and you think it's viral, is that going to be easy conversation? No, because I want you to do something, right? People feel like they're gypped if you just say, it's viral, just drink a lot of water, go get some rest, and you send them on their way, right? They're going to be like, well, they didn't do anything for me. I'm just as sick as I was when I came in here, right? People feel like you're doing something when you give them an antibiotic prescription, but that's incorrect, right? So, again, that's why you're going to be really good PAs and not do that. Um, so not following guidelines, right? So not following the first recommendation first-line recommended treatments or second-line recommended treatments, right? Um, double covering, anyone know what that means? Yeah, using two antibiotics, one, one will do, 
don't do that, right? There's certain use cases where that's appropriate. Sometimes you're going for synergy or sometimes you need really broad coverage, but just use one if you can get away with that. Um, not de-escalating or streamlining therapy. That's where I talked about when you have a patient, you don't know what they're infected with. You start with very broad coverage and then you narrow it down based off of what those cultures come back as. If you don't de-escalate, then you're going to be giving them much bigger um, antibiotics than what you really need in that case there. I saw a really good analogy um, for uh, this case here where it's like, you know, using, um, you know, burning down your house because you saw a spider in it. Like, you don't need to go to those extremes, right? Sometimes you, you can de-escalate and use just a little bit of maybe some elephant spray on the on the spider, and then that's good enough, right? So, um, and then really prolong antimicrobial therapy. So you find in the guidelines, it'll tell you specifically how long you should be treating for. And if you go much beyond that, again, you're just putting more selective pressure. You're going to see more of that resistance there, okay? Now, why do I think greater than seven days on mechanical ventilation? Why does that increase your risk? Again, it's a foreign body there. It's going to be easier for those bacteria to kind of grow in there. And then to treat that, you're going to give them more antibiotics. And then the longer they're on the ventilation, more likely more bugs are going to show up there. And so that can be a big problem. Um, prolonged hospital stays. So, again, we like to get people discharged as soon as you can. A lot of times that may not be possible. And then prior antibiotic use is a big thing. So using inappropriate prophylactic antibiotics, or maybe using them for too long, and then using a lot of broad-spectrum uh, antimicrobials here. And we'll talk about these specific agents here. These are very broad-covering antibiotics. And so if you use them kind of indiscriminately, you're going to find patients tend to show up in more resistant bacteria. Okay. And again, a very good question to ask anyone who you feel has an infection is ask, what have you taken recently, right? Because that oftentimes will guide your therapy. If they were just on amoxicillin, three weeks ago for an ear infection and they come back with another ear infection, guess what? Maybe that moxicillin is not going to do it. Maybe you got to step up your therapy, right? So you need to know those things. And we'll cover those uh, details when we get to those specific sections. So, and again, we see a lot of antibiotic use being used for animals. And so a lot of the meats that we're producing and things like that tend to also increase resistance. You do see more um, multi-drug resistant bugs and this MDR as a result of uh, animals getting way, way too many antibiotics. And so, again, I'm not going to cover all the details on how the, the bacteria become resistant, but there's a lot of different mechanisms, right? Sometimes they produce new enzymes that will cleave our drugs and make them ineffectual. Um, sometimes they'll actually change the target proteins and mutate them to the point where the drugs don't really work on them anymore. And just remember that they can share plasmas with one another, especially the gram negatives, and can share that, that resistance to other ones. And so, again, usually patients may not just have one type of bacteria present. It could be multiples, and that's how they can then share that resistance to one another. Okay. And again, how do we deal with this? Well, there's a lot of different steps we're going to take in, in place here, and especially in the hospital. You'll typically find there's the antimicrobial stewardship program. That basically means they're trying to steward. It's a group of people who are going to steward and try to guide clinicians in using the right type of antibiotics, the right durations, the right, you know, the, the, the right indications and things like that um, to try to make sure we're not kind of indiscriminately using those antibiotics. So as an example, and again, who do you think would be involved in an antimicrobial stewardship program? Infectious disease, for sure. Pharmacy is definitely involved. No one else. And usually, uh, not just infectious disease, like the, the docs are there, but usually the um, like infection control is part of the hospital, right? So they do a lot of things like in terms of decontaminating rooms and um, you know talking about things like um, protocols for you know MRSA colonization, um, you know different things like that. So it's a group, it's a multidisciplinary group to try to make sure they put the right guidelines on there. So when you order some crazy antibiotic does not indicate in the ER. We have these calls all the time where they want to start some, something crazy in the ER. And I'm just like, um, did you get ID approval for that? And they're like, mm, no. And I'm like, well, you can't have it. Right. So sometimes we get those phone calls. They're just like, what are you doing? Don't do that. Right. You got to have their proper approvals. Right. And they'll say, no, I got a call. You know, I talked to this so-and-so from ID and they said this is appropriate. And then, and then it's okay. Right. So, but again, it's part of that stewardship process to try to guide you towards the, the right decision there. Other things like de-escalation protocols, you know, treatment guidelines, um, you know, going from IV to PO. Why do you think that makes a difference in terms of resistant bugs? Well, again, if you have you have something in place, uh, IV catheter, that's another site for infection, right? You know, if you have central lines and things like that, those are sites for infection. Um, so again, switching over to PO can eliminate one of those sites, right? Um, you know, sometimes people will get put on IV fluids, even though the patient can take oral just fine, right? But again, that's a risk for infection. You got to be aware of that sort of thing there. So anyway, those are the things we do. Um, now, getting into specifically the, the determinants of like how, how do we select an antibiotic? Like how do we know which one we want to use? How do we dose it? How do we, you know... What are all the, the things that go into that? So a couple of key factors that we're going to be looking at when choosing the, the right drug. One of which is going to be the spectrum of activity. What does that mean? Drug 
yeah, what, what bacteria does it cover, right? Does this cover MRSA? Does it cover Pseudomonas? So what, what does it cover? Um, the pharmacokinetics. And most of you thought you could probably dump all that information, right? Nope, kinetics are going to come back and, and get you again, right? We always talk about that. The absorption, the distribution, right? Think about um, what type of areas in the body you think would be difficult for drugs to penetrate. Hmm? The brain, yeah, absolutely, right? So if you have a patient with meningitis, certain antibiotics have an easier time crossing that blood-brain barrier than others do, right? Uh, especially when you think about the meninges being inflamed, that actually makes it easier for some antibiotics to get across, right? Because those little, those little gaps between the cells get bigger when it's inflamed and some antibiotics can get across a little easier. So that's a particularly difficult area for drugs to penetrate. Uh, any other areas you might think of? The lungs tend to be another really hard one as well, right? So we're going to find that certain antibiotics cannot be used for lung infections, um, either because they, they get inactivated or they just don't penetrate very well. Uh, what if you had a drug that was metabolized completely in the liver? Do you think that'd be very good for a urinary tract infection? No, right? So again, this is how the kinetics actually come into play when deciding what kind of antibiotic we're going to be using here. So um, those are all going to be factors. Uh, pharmacodynamics. So again, uh, we'll talk about whether something's bactericidal versus bacteriostatic. Anyone we'll know the difference between that is? Cytos is going to kill it, right? So again, does it actually directly kill the bacteria, or when it's a bacteria static, what does that mean? It basically prevents them from replicating, right, from undergoing mitosis. So at that point, what is? How do you get rid of that infection? Yeah, don't forget your body has an immune system, right? So again, you're working in concert with the body's own immune system to deal with that. But think about what if you have a patient with a weakened immune system? Would you rather use bactericidal or bacteriostatic drug? Right, something's bactericidal, right? So again, that's influencing our decisions on what kind of drugs we're using. We'll talk about time versus concentration-dependent killing. That's going to do a lot to inform how we dose the drugs in terms of frequency. So if we're dosing something every 24 hours, or is it every six hours, right? Those are things we'll talk about. And then the toxicities are a big one as well, okay? A lot of these are going to cause a lot of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Why do you think that is? It disrupts the normal gut flora, right? So you're going to see a lot of diarrhea with these. Some of these are more likely to do that than others, as you'll see. Um, but you can see skin toxicities, hematologic toxicities. We'll get into those. Um, and don't forget, a lot of these are renally eliminated. And so you have to watch renal function. You have to watch for your dosing for that. And again, some patients are very um, unstable in terms of renal function. You may have to go back and check day to day to see how their function is changing to see if you need to change that dose, right? Those really sick ICU patients with like sepsis or something. Um, and so not only that, but then some of the antibiotics are nephrotoxic. And so then, again, you have to watch for that sort of thing to see how it's influencing the, their, their function. So as I mentioned with the bactericidal versus bacteriostatic, again, the bactericidal ones are such that um, they're disruptive enough where it just directly kills off the bacteria itself, right? Um, so you think about things like um, drugs that open up the cell wall of the bacteria. That sounds pretty deadly, right? If I opened up your skin, you'd probably die as well, right? So you can kind of think about it that way. Um, not that I would do that to you guys. I like you too much. Um, but things that are cell wall active, you're going to find tend to be much more bactericidal. Things that maybe disrupt DNA enough to where it actually triggers apoptosis in the cells, that's probably bactericidal too, right? However, you're going to find that there's some drugs that are bacteriostatic where they just inhibit the further replication and further function of the bacteria. So think about things like if I were to stop you from producing new proteins, is that going to be directly you know, a killing effect for the bacteria? Not really. You know, they can't produce new proteins. It can still probably truck on for a little bit, but then eventually um, you're going to have that immune system kick in and eventually take over that. So we'll talk about those details in just a little bit here. And then um, concentration versus time dependent is another important concept we're going to look at here. Um, bless you. So basically when we say concentration dependent killing, that means we're shooting for the highest possible concentration that we can get, and then we let the, the concentration of that drug fall. Okay. Now, when I mentioned the MIC before, what is the MIC? A minimum inhibitory concentration. You're going to find there's certain antibiotics we can give really big doses of, and even though the drug concentration drops below the MIC, the bacteria still kind of don't continue to replicate for a little while. That's what we call the post-antibiotic effect. I kind of call it the shock and awe sort of phenomenon, where you give them such a big dose, they kind of get shocked and not replicating any further. And then even though the drug concentrations drop down pretty low before your next dose, it's okay. The bacteria don't continue to replicate. That's what we call concentration-dependent killing. I'll show you some graphs to make more sense of that in a little bit. Versus time-dependent killing, these are antibiotics you want to keep above the MIC for as long as possible. Ideally, it would be 100% of the time, but knowing that we can't really do that, um, maybe 40 to 70% of the time of that dosing interval, the drug concentration should be above the MIC. Okay? If they start to drop below the MIC, guess what? Bacteria are going to start to replicate again. Okay? This means that you have to use something like a continuous infusion 
or something like very frequent dosing, maybe um, you know every six hours or so. Now, what's the problem with using a continuous infusion of a drug? Hmm? You could, but um, you know you can adjust for the dose and all that. But think about just the logistics of having one line that is con constantly being taken up by that drug. What if you need to get fluids? What if you need to give other antibiotics? You know, depending on IV access for the patient, that may be really difficult, right? Maybe you have to add extra lines just to be able to get other drugs into the patient, right? And obviously, a continuous infusion is not going to be good for outpatient use. Okay, right? So think about some of the logistics uh, of, of doing these things there. So frequent dosing is going to be common when looking at the time-dependent killers. So if you're looking at that, imagine you are giving a medication here and you're looking at the levels, and this line here is going to indicate the MIC for the bacteria. And if you notice here, you're going to see that these are kind of um, uh, little cuvettes growing the bacteria. And you notice as the concentration of the drug gets higher, you notice eventually it gets clear, right? That it gets clear when you've killed off all of those bacteria, okay? Now, what you find is that here when you get above the MIC is when you're going to start to get that initial antibiotic kill. And then in some cases, when it drops below the MIC, the bacteria can then start to grow again, right? And so what you're looking for in some cases is this area under the curve, like how long can you spend over the MIC? And that's going to be better for those concentration-dependent killers there. I'm sorry, the, the time-dependent killers, as you'll see there. So again, time above MIC is very good for time-dependent antibiotics. Because as soon as it drops below the MIC, bacteria continue to grow again. Versus when you see the concentration-dependent killers, this is where you want to get a really high concentration. Even though you drop below the MIC, guess what? You still have that post-antibiotic effect, and you're still going to be able to kill off those bacteria. Okay. So if something like this is a concentration-dependent killer, I may give it maybe only every 24 hours. What is the benefit of giving it 24 hours for all that drug to clear out of the body? A compliance, yeah, so you're giving it less frequently for sure. But just the levels of the drugs, you're getting close to zero. That means you're not accumulating a lot of drug, meaning you're getting less toxicity potentially. Sometimes if I have to give a drug very con constantly, you know, you see that uh, you try to keep it above the MIC for as long as possible. You can see accumulation and potentially you can see that toxicity that can develop there, right? So there's uh, some concerns we'll have. We'll look at more details on that. Hmm? Um, no, you wouldn't be able to really quantify it. It's just one of the things you just know certain antibiotics are going to have when they're they're concentration dependent. Mm -hmm. so I figure if it gets lower, then it's getting not necessarily, because again, you're at that point when you had that post antibiotic effect. It's basically the bacteria is not really actively replicating to kind of develop that resistance, I guess. So yeah, so even though, and again, it'd be like every 24 hours, so by the time you get down to probably nothing in the body, then you're dosing them again and getting that same post antibiotic effect all over. Okay, so here are the categories of antibiotics we're going to run into. Um, you can refer back to this. Um, I'm going to talk about most of these. There's a few that I'll probably uh, hold off and talk about in specific sections later on. Um, but these are the majority of the drugs we're going to we're going to get into. So we can refer back to this, and this is good to help you memorize, um, you know, the different mechanisms for the different drugs, kind of what buckets they fit into from that standpoint. Um, remember, when you're using two different antibiotics, do you think you want to use two drugs that work through the same mechanism or drugs that have different mechanisms? Yeah, you want to have synergy there by choosing two different mechanisms. Sometimes we'll actually have a combination of drugs. One may work on cell wall synthesis to disrupt the cell wall and then allows other antibiotics to get in and actually work better on things like the ribosomes, right? So again, think about that in terms of synergy. Different mechanisms is always going to be preferable to using the same mechanism as you'll see, okay? So let's go ahead and we'll do a 10-minute break. We'll come back and then go on to the next section. Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, slide 23, what does that mean? Slide 23, which one is that? That one? Yeah, so for the time-dependent antibiotics, it means that they have no post-antibiotic effect. So once they drop below the MIC, then the bacteria just start to replicate again. Okay. Yep, any other questions? Okay, let's do 10 minutes. We'll come back and actually get into the antibiotics.